Peace and love, party people. My name is Talib Kweli. I am the host of the world's best podcast, The People's Party. It is my honor and my pleasure to be rocking with you live from the Blue Note, the classic legendary Blue Note Jazz Club. I've been doing shows here. And today's guest has been my partner in doing these shows, and we've been having such a great time. I'm so glad that I could bring a classic, classic artist and musician with me in this 50th year of hip-hop to represent with me at the Blue Note. Music is music. The music that we do is just good music. You shouldn't have to put it in any genre. But, you know, it makes a lot of sense to separate it by genres to sell the music. Today, we're not here to try to sell you anything. So we're just gonna have a conversation about where the music takes us and where the music is going. And our guest today is one of the best jazz, keyboardists, arrangers, record producers of all time. Easily one of the most sampled artists in the world of hip hop. He's added so much to the sound of hip hop. His sound is foundational to what we know as hip hop. Everybody from Eric B and Rakim to Run DMC, Ghostface Killer, Jazzy Jeff to Fresh Prince, J. Rue the Damage to Freddie Gibbs. I mean, the list goes on and on. Warren G, Will I Am, uh, uh, it goes on and on and on and on. He's won a lot of awards and accolades, a long, fruitful solo career, albums one, two, three, and four, Heads, Touchdown, Lucky Seven, 101, Earl Clue, uh, Collaborations, Double Vision, just to name a few. The group four play, he's given us all types of records and everything. We have so much to say about this man, but I want to get into the interview because I want to ask him some questions. The People's Party is proud to have Bob James in a place to be. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise. Give it up. Show your love. How are you, Mr. James? Thank you for sitting down with us at the People's Party. Thank you for inviting me. Man, this is an honor. Well, first of all, this is the second year in a row that we've been doing this thing at the Blue Note together. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. My father raised me on a lot of music and a lot of it was yours. And the album covers at that age, you, I'm not sophisticated en enough to really understand what I'm hearing. But the album covers were so incredible to me and I would gravitated to these records and these records are part of my childhood soundtrack. And then when hip hop started sampling a lot of your music, that just became the fabric of what it is that I do musically. So I wanted to just thank you for that off time. Well, you're welcome. And thank you very much because I think you are the, what you represent and mm -hmm. the openness uh, and willingness to talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the first time that I feel really comfortable about being face to face talking about this difference between hip hop, the similarities, mm -hmm. and I'm still trying to understand why my music got <laughs> sampled so much. Uh, I almost made it a crusade this year to learn mm -hmm. specifically, and your invitation to me last year to join you, and not just a sample of me, me, right. <laughs> me coming right. out. It wasn't, Live in the flesh. It wasn't a cassette, it wasn't an LP, right. it wasn't a CD, it was me playing live. Uh, I felt so much frustration over the years that in these recordings, uh, I couldn't say that I directly collaborated. Mm. It was just the recordings themselves. Now, this week and also last year, we actually collaborated. That's and it right. was really fun. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And we had collaborated with some of the best luminaries in hip hop uh, from uh, 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 Buckshot, uh, from Black Moon, and Havoc, from Mob Deep, and Run DMC. And Run said, You put me in the Hall of Fame <laughs> because uh, he. Uh, uh, Mardi Gras was sampled in one of their biggest records ever, Peter Piper. And of course, he explained to both of us, which I didn't remember until he said it, that that's Grandmaster Flash is cutting up Mardi Gras in his kitchen at home in the movie Wild Style. The movie Wild Style is very important to hip hop. It is the first film that we saw where we saw ourselves. And so those bells in that record also are kind of, I think, why you hear Breaking the Bells or LL Cool J talking about Rock the Bells. Like, when you think about the bells, it come from that record. Can I just, a little bit out of context, mm -hmm. bring up the name Ralph McDonald mm -hmm. to you? Because um, 
Ralph was good friend, session percussion player, and composer of many great R&B songs. Mm -hmm. He was doing a session for me when I did a jazz cover version of uh, Take Me to the Mardi Gras. Mm -hmm. And we wanted some atmospheric, rhythmic sounds, and Ralph dug down deeply into his bag of percussion gear and uh -huh. pulled out the go-go bell uh -huh. and started going dun 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 And little did we know, little would have Ralph known uh -huh. that uh, this very spontaneous uh, question that I asked, mm -hmm. give me some atmosphere on my recording, and it happened, and I went on with my life uh, <laughs> after, and, and then I started hearing about bells. I went, right. what are you talking about? I, don't, I didn't even, didn't know what that meant, and, uh, and it just kept going on, mm -hmm. and every time I think, please, Bob, don't think you can take too much credit, because the the bell guy on my album was Ralph McDonald. But you also were the one who was like, I need some this, this atmosphere. And sure. that's just the vibe, right? You're creating a vibe. Um, and R Ralph and I had a kind of unintentional reciprocal. Neither one of us knew that we were going to be sampled in that kind mm -hmm. of way. But Ralph had composed a song called Mr. Magic on a jazz record for Grover Washington Jr. That's and I had record. written written the intro, uh, but... Basically, it was Ralph's song that they talked about. And Take Me to the Mardi Gras, they ended up talking about me. So we kind of both were behind the scenes, having no idea that the world of hip-hop would even come along. In a Mr. Magic record, I think the song Hydra is on that, on that record? Yep, that's my composition, yeah. That's yours, yours, right? And so Buckshot Shorty, we probably should have done, he has a song called How Many MCs, which samples that record. Come, take in the back, come follow me on a journey of a real MC. And he, sa he samples that record. So mm -hmm. we had him come on and play the record because that yeah. was the bigger song, but we should have did that. <laughs> if Buckshot come back tonight, I think he come back tonight, we might have to get into that Hydra. Yeah. All right, that sounds good. <laughs> I, I, it's not your choice, hey, Alice. I'm talking to Bob James here. <laughs> um, yeah, Paul Simon, the Mardi Gras is a Paul Simon song. Um, and a lot of people don't don't know that song. I think I think people know your version more than the Paul Simon version. I wish Paul were here to defend himself <laughs> right now. Shout to, out to Ryman he, Ryman Simon. He had bars. <laughs> <laughs> Defender Rhodes is something that hip hop is endeared to. I don't know what it is about that instrument, but we really love that instrument. I felt so comfortable playing it last night mm. with you, and I rarely play it these days mm -hmm. because I still prefer for myself the big concert grand acoustic piano mm -hmm. but there definitely was a, uh, something about that sound I think that got my ears uh, in the right way back in the 1970s and I was called upon to do lots and lots of sessions as mm -hmm. a sideman and they would always ask for Fender Rhodes. Yeah. Um, I, I think I had a kind of touch for that instrument without even thinking about it that was different uh, and Gee, a lot of my music history is very much tied in with that sound. Now, you were born in Missouri, correct? Yep. Do you remember in Missouri your first interaction with what they call jazz or blues music? Sort of. Uh, not much jazz in my town. It was a small okay. farm town. Marshall was the name of it. And so they had maybe one radio station, only country music. My parents were not especially jazz fans. They had mostly classical music in their collection, but they had a couple of jazz records. Stan mm -hmm. Kenton was okay. a record that they had in their collection and not having any idea about even jazz history in my early elementary school years, mm -hmm. I started listening to a few things that they had and it maybe caught my ear a little bit, but okay. uh, I had to go to another town 30 miles away from my town to actually find a place where I could sit in and actually mm. play. So most of the what I became immersed in and fell in love with about jazz happened after I left my hometown. Okay. Is your mother from 
New Orleans? New Orleans, yeah. Okay. Yes. And she instinctively kind of got why I had some jazz in my roots mm-hmm. and in, in my soul it somewhere. That's a jazzy town. But she did not want me to go into jazz. She had another mm-hmm. image of me as a somebody wearing a tuxedo and, and playing Beethoven and Bach as mm-hmm. a classical musician. And so she, I had to convince her that that was not going to be my lot in life. And I had to beg her not to make me practice too much because I didn't, I mean, I think part of the reason why I like jazz in the first place is that I didn't have to practice. <laughs> I, I thought <laughs> no, you no, could right. make that up as you go along. Certain freedoms. Um, you're very, very adept at music that's traditionally associated with black, black people. And as you said, you didn't grow up in a town where you got a lot of that. You had to go 30 miles away. Your town, the high school you went to was a segregated high school. Is that correct? Until my senior year. First, Until your desegregation year. happened in my senior year. In fact, the, the black people had to take a bus mm-hmm. to a town 30 miles away to go to high school, which was so um, incomprehensible to me. But yes, I lived in that kind of a segregated town. It's crazy to me to think because you're right here with us and people think about that stuff as being so far away, but it's very, very recent history. Yeah, and still going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the schools are absolutely still segregated. It's not on the books, but you know you can't legislate against these type of attitudes. Mm-hmm. People still have these type of attitudes. Um, and so you ended up from this high school going to uh, University of Michigan? Yes. And you, go ahead. I'm, well, well, just they also not much into jazz education at that time, mm-hmm. and I didn't even find out about it until I got there. They were had a very famous music school, but it was uh, either marching band stuff or classical music. And mm-hmm. I, at one point during my education, switched over to the Berkeley School in Boston. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was a little bit hooked on Michigan already, the, the large university, mm-hmm. the ability to study things in so many different areas outside of music, Mm -hmm. the big campus. I think there were 40,000 people then, maybe a lot more that Mm -hmm. were at the big university. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go back there and get a, what I perceived well-rounded kind of education. Mm -hmm. Most of my jazz stuff was extracurricular. I'd take a drive into Detroit and sit in with some jazz groups there. And that's where it really started to sink into me that I wanted to do that for my life. Right, and that made sense to go to Berkeley after that, right? Because uh, a lot of my guys I work with are from Berkeley. Um, and I remember I wanted my son to go to a school. I didn't un- understand what Berkeley was. He ended up going to Full Sail, which is more like music business school. Mm-hmm. But he lasted a couple of months. He was like, Dad, I can't do this. I'm not trying to learn how to like be an accountant at a record label. I'm trying to learn how to you know, get into music business. So yeah, he found his own way to that. Now, you got the opportunity early in your career to work with Quincy Jones. Sure did. Can you tell uh, us about that? I don't know about you and your career, but for my career, I can look back at so many of the most important pivotal moments mm-hmm. were kind of accidents, mm-hmm. fluke, that you didn't expect. You didn't plan for it. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to try to do this specific thing so I could meet Quincy Jones or something mm-hmm. like that. that. That's not the way it worked out for me. Mm-hmm. But it happened anyway at a festival that I was only going down there uh, uh, for what I perceived to be a little bit of a joke against mm-hmm. the jazz establishment. I was playing some pretty avant-garde music at that time uh, that was way away from mainstream jazz, and it caught Quincy's ears. Mm-hmm. He, I, I, I was prepared that the judges and all the people would hate some of the stuff that we were doing, and I was doing it deliberately anyway, as a kind of confrontational right. thing. The fact that Quincy was sympathetic with that idea um, allowed me to meet him, uh, allowed me to prevail in that mm-hmm. competition to the degree that he signed me to, to make a record for him mm-hmm. producing it in my first. Yeah, I got a chance to work with Quincy Jones. He, he, did, a, he did a theme song for Ironside, mm-hmm. and then he did a record where his idea was to get a bunch of hip hop performers to redo some of his classic music. Mm-hmm. So, and we got, I, at least for me, I got the session, they gave me the session for the Ironside. Um, uh, theme, theme from Ironside, 
was the was the song. Yeah, I remember the music. Yeah, and I redid that song. It was a good time. It was a good time. What was your perception of Quincy just as a human being? Oh, that's a G. My friend, <laughs> Quincy Jones is who you want to be when you grow up. To me, I am, you know, his his he's somebody who he started like with Sinatra and them back in the days, right? Like like, you know, you you go from Sinatra to Michael Jackson, you know, Brothers Johnson and all this stuff he's doing. He's like a, he's like a jazz guy that proved to the world that music is genreless. Mm. You know, he's a jazz guy that proved that you can't put a jazz guy in a box. Yeah. And he he was more than a musician. He was yeah. a kind of an entity. And what I can remember, well, I remember many things, but one of them had to do with watching the same musicians mm -hmm. that I was working with on a regular basis as a sideman, and we were mm -hmm. doing session dates and all that. But then we'd get a call to do a Quincy Jones session, and all the same musicians, I was noticing suddenly they were playing better. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's going on here? He's, yeah. just, he's just sitting in there in the control room with his personality and his warmth, mm -hmm. uh, waiting to make some kind of a comment. but. I, I ended up coming over to some of these guys that I knew really well. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you do that on my session? <laughs> <laughs> he was just sitting there. Right. You know, it was just, all the, of us were the same, but his right. aura, his mm -hmm. presence made the music happen. A friend of mine, Chaz Van Queen, has a saying, vibes don't lie. And I think he brings the right vibe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about Nautilus for a second. This song is amazing. Um, it's one of the most sampled songs in hip hop. Creed said that it sounded like a submarine, right? So that's mm -hmm. why it's called Nautilus. Now I want to list for my audience because I have a very hip hop centric audience, just some of the songs that Nautilus comes from, you know. And um, I'm sorry if you don't get paid from a lot of this, but <laughs> that's a whole other subject. <laughs> there's a lot of them. Um, there's Beast to the Rhyme by Run DMC, Daytona 500 by Ghostface Killer, Children's Story, Slick Rick, Anti Nigger Machine, Public Enemy. Uh, Brothers on My Jock by EPMD. Let the Rhythm Hit Him, uh, Eric B. and Rakim. Live from the Barbecue, main source. Throw Your Guns in the Air by Onyx. Cruddy Click by Naughty by Nature. Clap Your Hands by Tribe Called Quest. Uh, Mind Spray by J. Rue the Damager. Uh, some Will Come Out by Pete Rock. That's just some of them. I have a whole list uh, that I could keep going. You have Idris Muhammad on the drums. He's from New Orleans, so there's a theme there. Um, um, tell me about making that record. Yeah, maybe it isn't uh, just a coincidence that Idris was also from New Orleans and my mother was from there. Yeah, I don't and, know. You, and you got a record called Mardi Gras. It's like, there's a whole thing going on. Idris played in a way that was like a New Orleans street beat, no matter mm -hmm. what tune. I would bring him a tune and he'd play the same. Mm -hmm. Same street beat, couldn't resist it. The, 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 it was in the cracks of, you couldn't write it out, you couldn't talk about it, mm -hmm. but he would just start playing and it would feel good. Mm -hmm. So I have great respect and deep memories of having the opportunity to have him be a big part of my records, especially when he was sitting next to Gary King, who was playing bass mm -hmm. with an equally deep, deep, deep groove and the two of them. Uh, made me feel like all I had to do was just float and then do a little, a few little licks over the top of it, and we had some magic grooves going on. Uh, Nautilus was, I can truthfully say, almost a throwaway. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a bunch of other songs that I had concentrated on that I had auditioned for Creed Taylor, and we had a concept of the way we wanted the album to go, mm -hmm. but we didn't quite have enough material. Mm -hmm. and. I can still pretty clearly remember the session going across the Tappan Zee Bridge mm -hmm. to New Jersey and taking 9W Highway down to Inglewood Cliffs where uh, Rudy Van Gelder's studio was. And I didn't have um, a chart. I didn't have anything specific planned for that day. Mm -hmm. So I did have this little bass line in my head that I wanted Gary King to play and I knew that, that he would hook me up by turning my little lick into magic just by the way he played the bass and mm -hmm. he could make it work. So um, we played this piece that didn't have a title, you know, song number 10 or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I liked it. 
Uh, and I was kind of indulging myself in my memory that Creed Taylor gave me a budget mm -hmm. to overdub uh, um, sometimes large string orchestra, production, mm -hmm. woodwinds, different kind of things. And every song that I didn't have a clear idea about, I felt like I could, I could dress it up a little bit by adding some strings to it, something right. like that. And, strings are amazing. And they do change the, the character. <laughs> yeah. And in this particular case, I used the fact that we had an extra tune to put a fancy string arrangement on it with the idea of maybe I might get a movie score date out of it or I might wow. get a, another gig That's out of it. That's so cinematic. And so, and uh, uh, Nautilus, the biggest feel is the groove, the Idris Muhammad's feel, but it also has a kind of mystery about it that I think attracted to hip hop producers mm -hmm. because it was cinematic yeah. yes and it was both funky groove and, and this is only me trying to analyze it way after the fact after i found out that all these people sampled it right. why you know I, I'm, right. I'm, I'm still asking that question but right. i think of those elements of the the first the groove idris and gary and we're establishing this Pretty simple, repetitive kind of groove, mm -hmm. easy to chop up, whatever. <laughs> right, right. whatever. And then right. over the top of that was some strings, and I believe it might have been an ARP Odyssey sound that Creed heard that made it sound like a submarine. Right. Uh, and all of that was a throwaway tune that we didn't think we'd get any airplay, mm -hmm. and we didn't, mm -hmm. uh, because of Feel Like Making Love, my, instrumental version got all the airplay Beautiful for the record. most part and that's the part the DJs paid attention to and Nautilus was hidden side B the last mm -hmm. cut to me it was just I had fun doing it but I didn't think anybody would pay that much attention to it in hip hop we have a saying that goes the B side wins again Really? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's sure true that's with me. That's public enemy, right? Yeah. The B side wins again that because it's always the B side that the people gravitate yeah. towards. Yeah. The A side is what the label wants you to put out, mm -hmm. but the B side wins again. Um, Rudy Van Gelder, the Van Gelder studio is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So much Blue Note music was was made there. Um, he had like special techniques that he would use, right? Yeah, definitely. And he was very protective about them. <laughs> okay. He did not like to talk about it. Uh -huh. He did not like us asking questions about it. Mm -hmm. And very often, whenever he could, he would keep us out of the control room. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember trying to look at his his rack of mm -hmm. all of his gear, his EQ and his reverbs and his uh, all these mm -hmm. uh, gear. And he had put black tape over the name, brand mm -hmm. names, so that he didn't want us to know what kind of equipment that he used. A very, very oh, mysterious wow, that's guy. That's very hip hop, though, because that's what DJs would do. We put tape and, and cover white labels over the records because you can't see what record. There was, it wasn't. It wasn't who sampled back in the days. There was no. There was no internet who sampled. Um, and you've, we've talked about Creed Taylor a few times, but can you break down who Creed Taylor is in that CTI sound? He looms in my memory so deep uh, in relationship to Quincy, because Quincy was the first name he brought up. Mm -hmm. But literally the pivotal time in my career happened when Quincy was making an album for Creed Taylor mm -hmm. that ended up being called Walking in Space. Mm -hmm. And I got hired by Quincy to play the piano, but also to write one of the arrangements. Mm -hmm. And it proved to be my audition for Creed, who I'd never worked for him mm -hmm. uh, prior to that. And he, he liked what he heard. And just by that time, having the badge of Quincy Jones hiring me was uh, enough credibility that um, it carried a lot of weight. Right. So uh, the Walking Space record was a beautiful record for Quincy. I think it helped his career too, mm -hmm. the, the success of it. And riding along on those coattails and getting the opportunity to start getting hired by Creed Taylor as an arranger and pianist was very, very pivotal yes. to me. Yes, indeed. One of my favorites by you is Night on Bald Mountain. Um, you know, I grew up on Fantasia. You know, I remember watching that in Fantasia. It was very scary. This wasn't for children, this yeah. Disney movie. Yeah. 
and, um, and, and, and Nine on Bald Mountain was also on the same album as Nautilus. Right. And it got, Nine on Bald Mountain got a lot of airplay alongside Feel Like Making Love. Big Another record. reason why the B side with Nautilus got, got uh, hidden right. away and nobody paid attention to it. What made you want to record that record? Um, it's like based on a Russian opera or something. Uh, oh, Nine on Bald Mountain? Yeah. Uh, the, most of the classical pieces that I adapted and mm. other artists also came out of Creed Taylor's hobby more than mm. mine. I, I had studied it in college. I was trained to be able to write those kind of arrangements. Mm -hmm. But Creed was very interested in, in taking a familiar classical theme and then having a jazz artist reinterpret it. Okay. So that's why I got the assignment. And maybe Creed and I both came up with the idea of specifically Night on Bow Mountain. Mm -hmm. I wanted something uh, fast and, and full of energy. Mm -hmm. uh, that filled the bill for me. And I like to use high brass uh, thing. It's so intense. It's like a movie. It's like, it's like you, it's, I feel like I'm watching that song. Mm. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so now two comes out. I feel a song in my heart. This is such a beautiful, beautiful record. And how about Patty Austin singing it? Patty, she's yeah. She, she, anything you put in front of her, she's mm -hmm. gonna make it sound great. But it, uh, it also uh, very important part of what started to make me believe that I had to pursue a solo artist career. Right mm -hmm. at that time. I was having fun being a session guy, mm -hmm. and it was steady work, and I didn't have to go on the road, and pretty much thought it was my life, and doing some of those arrangements, like the Night on Ball Mountain and all of that, were also my idea of having a, a repertoire of music that I could use for an audition to mm -hmm. get other arranging jobs, mm -hmm. more than it was establishing a solo artist identity, which kind of came along later. Yeah, it's funny you say that because What's interesting about your music and the type of music that you and some of your contemporaries were doing um, from like, a, you know, a George Benson or just, you know, people who weren't pop singers or pop artists. You guys were starting labels, getting deals on major labels. And this I, I, this wasn't really this was a very unique thing. What do you think that was? Well, in my case, um, I did have a chance to start my own small label mm -hmm. eventually, uh, but I w watched Cree Taylor. Mm -hmm. uh, I watched how a label that had a very specific creative identity, mm -hmm. different from a, a big corporate label that had hundreds and hundreds of artists. In Cree Taylor's case, he had his own stamp. Mm -hmm. Every record, the way they looked, the way they sounded was coming out of his creativity um, almost like a small dictator of the mm -hmm. art. And something about that appealed to me at the time when I finally left, I wondered whether I would have the opportunity to do something similar to that. Right, okay. Four comes out. Um, Pure Imagination is aptly titled. Um, the song Tap and Z, that's you named your label Tap and Z. You have this unique relationship with the Tap and Z bridge. I do. Yeah. And it was very close to my home. I was living in Westchester County, mm -hmm. and the uh, that bridge was the shortest route for me to get to Rudy Van Gelder's studio. And now I've been around so darn long, the bridge isn't even called that it's anymore. Right, right. <laughs> even the Tap and Z bridge is obsolete. Yeah, the, what is the, it called now? I the Governor Cuomo. Yeah, I still call it the Tappan And that's controversial, so there's some movement to make it go back. <laughs> yeah. I, I hear them, that, so maybe so my record label no. will be meaningful again, uh, or well, the, pertinent. I heard you tell a funny story about, you know, that record achieved prominence again when Arrested Development sampled it um, for their song, Everyday People, and it was like they had another version of the song that wasn't working for them, so they sampled your song right, the metamorphosis mix of the song. But I've heard you talk about the fact that it was hard for you to get involved with the clearance of it because of, because they had also uh, interpolated Sign the Family Stone, right? Yes, and uh, we could have many, many long, long discussions about <laughs> that. And the, the changes, which I feel mm -hmm. like I've been a part of because in the early days of mm -hmm. hip hop, the the whole legal thing was not together. Mm -hmm. the, the record companies weren't paying attention. I believe a lot of the artists were just very naive that mm -hmm. there was such a thing as a copyright where 
music could be copyrighted in that way and you had to get permission to use it. Right. So that wasn't happening. And I found myself on the uh, policeman end of it or the, the, <laughs> the confrontational mm -hmm. end of it. It was uncomfortable. I, I, I never wanted to be that. And as a matter of fact, my whole feeling about why I chose jazz in the first place was that it was freedom. It was yeah. do whatever you want, whatever comes into your mind. And that feeling coming out of rap and hip hop was fun to me. And I, I got that part of it. But, but I also was more and more realizing that for any of us mm -hmm. who deal with the arts and have uh, intellectual property, something we create, and we can take it to the copyright office, and we can get a copyright on it, and we can protect it, defend it, lease it, sell it, rent it, and it's, a, it's an entity for us th that, in my case, pretty much defined my livelihood. And yes, I, I wanted to have that image of protecting it mm -hmm. and educating, not to rip the hip hop artist that sampled it without permission, but it was more important for me to have the education process go forward so that these days I, it's infinitely easier to, to get a license on a sample because everything is in place and we can make the cost of obtaining a license much, much more available to young artists that can't afford to pay a big advance or anything like that. And it's only when, when the, for me, the toughest part and sometimes the good part too was the, the record comes out with my sample on it, mm -hmm. becomes a big hit and they didn't license it. Then my lawyer immediately, his, his eyes pop out, right. okay, because now it's already out there. Right. You can't deny it. And uh, the negotiation becomes in the favor of the person who owns that copyright. So all of that education process, I'm, I'm, I don't feel any regret for having taken a tough stance, mm -hmm. including trying to take a tough stance on Arrested Development's mm -hmm. use at that mm -hmm. time, which was very, very complicated. Uh, and, and even more complicated mm -hmm. because you, you told the story about the original version came out of Arrested Development's mm -hmm. record, didn't have my music on it, and it didn't make it. They released it, the single came out, didn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And somebody involved in, the, in their team, and I wasn't involved at all creatively, uh, experimented around with adding my piece to it, and they decided to do Metamorphosis Mix, came out, became a big hit. Mm -hmm. But uh, subtly, what went on, and I'm probably not supposed to talk to <laughs> about these details <laughs> because there was a settlement somewhere right. along the line with me that I, uh, uh, that involved co confidentiality. Mm -hmm. But here I'm, I'm here and uh, talking to Talib. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> you know, we all family. Freestyle, you know, yeah, we're talking we're freestyle. freestyle. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what made it so complex uh, and so easy to get lost in legalese was the income started to come in from that record, uh, but not to the metamorphosis mix. Ah. Uh, but the way it was logged with the ASCAP or the way the payments started to come in. That's pretty slick. It, it was very slick. <laughs> Even slick, Rick huh? himself wouldn't have come up with it. <laughs> but but it, it went on for enough years mm -hmm. that by the time I caught up to that mm -hmm. and realized that there was all this money uh, that had been made, but the income went into the copyright that I didn't have any part of. Mm -hmm. And so my lawyer finally found out about it, and we were saying, wait, wait just a minute, you know. Uh, and once again, big problem with statute of limitations mm -hmm. and what I thought could have been lucrative mm -hmm. for me uh, did not <laughs> turn out right. that way on, in that particular case. Yeah, it's... Thank you for sharing all that. It's a learning process on both sides because um, me as a creative and as a, a person, 
I understand why you started Tappan Z Records when you did the, to have that type of control. So I could imagine it would be very frustrating that you, you you get out from under the thumb of whatever you are under the thumb of. And now you have your own and now you have people just taking pieces of it. There are people who, who took a hard stance on it. And I think I commend you on figuring out through the years the way in which it makes sense to you intellectually business wise like okay i can see it working this way there's a way to do it right it's not that we don't want to be creative i think it took you some time to understand the intentionality behind hip-hop is to pay tribute and i think you correctly said that we a lot of us didn't know better there was very hard line stances in hip-hop the attitudes in hip-hop when we first started sampling I, and i'm not i can't obviously speak from the whole for the whole genre but for me as a young fan because I wasn't participating at this time. As a young fan, it was like, yo, y'all old, we make y'all hot. You know what I'm saying? Like, I they feel like that, that was the attitude. Many times. Yeah. Oh, they've said that to oh, you. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so it's like, I'm not making this up. I feel like the attitude was like, yo, nobody would care about these records if we didn't sample them. And there's, there's a cultural aspect of that that can be true with the right intention. Mm. That, listen, the spirit of collaboration, a rising tide lifts all boats. But it's only if you're in the boat. You know what I'm saying? Sure. If you're not in the boat and the tide is just rising. And so I think it took it, it took I think it took you having graciousness and patience to see through the frustration and have understanding and have a have wanting to show solidarity with other artists. And I took it it, it took hip hop to grow up and to make some money and to be like, well, wait a second. Well, I don't want somebody sampling, take it from me. You know, because it started with young kids who didn't have anything. So it's like, as young kids who had nothing, like, why are you trying to take from me? I don't have anything. But then hip-hop grows up, and it's like, well, wait a second. You grow up, and you get, you get a record deal, and you put out your record, and then you're like, okay, where's my money? And they're like, no, this sample, you sampled this, you sampled that, you didn't write this, you didn't write that. You're like, hold on, wait a second. No, I need my money. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a growing process that it's like uh, a budding of heads that these communities came together. And, it, and I think it's not just in the sampling, but just in terms of like, live music and how live music is treated. Hip hop is like, hip hop I feel like is put on a pedestal because of how much they've been able to milk it, how much money they've been able to get out of it a lot for a long time. I think we're just now seeing a resurgence, even with us being able to do something like this at the Blue Note, um, or, or us, us as artists being forward thinking and saying what DMC said on stage was very important. You met DMC for the first time because we were able to do this. And he said, forget the politics, forget the different, uh, uh, differences in your belief systems or whatever art brings everybody together and I think if the artists just communicate we can we can solve all those problems we don't need the legalese havoc from mob deep was here uh rizza was here to see you they came to pay tribute you know what i'm saying because they understand it was a very warm moment for me mm -hmm. the first night with dmc mm -hmm. when he came up to me and just completely acknowledged my contribution and the, that it, it was a general com contribution that didn't have anything to do with my sample that was used on their recording, but it was just warm and we could be friends. Yeah. And I could, there, there were times that were litigious, and there was anger on my part, there was frustration on their part that I would even uh, be fighting the legal battle. but. Time marches on, and we're all musicians, and just being able to be friends and confront this whole topic and talk about mm -hmm. it in a different way. Me wanting to still, with any musician that I meet from any genre, uh, um, tell my story of belief in how important it is for us to hold on to our creativity, protect it properly, license it properly, all of those things are our livelihood. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to be just the pawn of big business and mm -hmm. just have them pay us whatever they feel that they're supposed to. If, if we understand our creativity, yes. understand how to define it mm -hmm. in a in a, in a legal way that we can defend, then uh, we can relax and make our art. Yes, yes indeed, yes indeed. Thank you for sharing that. Um, there's so many records that, have so, there's so many of your songs that have been sampled. I could talk about them all day, and I, but I'm gonna have to cut some of these on the list because it's just too many. Um, but I do wanna talk about Westchester Lady. Um, my father was uh, raised in Westchester. And so I think, 
you know, he was a young man coming of age when you were doing the Tap and Z thing. So I think that's there's a connection there. And uh, Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince did a great job with this. It's one of the greatest hip hop records of all time. Here we go again. I don't know the business behind that sample situation, but for us, it was a classic. But I'm bringing it up because myself and Bun B, an uh, artist from a uh, rap group called UGK, we have a new album we're putting together. And we have a track that samples Westchester Lady that we're going through the proper channels. You know what I'm saying? I'm just letting you know here. That's my lawyer back there. Yeah, we're going to holler at you in a minute. Um, is, did you do something with Tracklib? Yes, I am affiliated now. I have a, an arrangement with, with Tracklib where I make my stuff available. Mm -hmm. And it's a really, I think, a really cool concept because mm -hmm. the whole company is structured around like a library mm -hmm. of music that's already been pre-cleared. Right. We already have all of the legal stuff in place so that a young um, hip-hop producer or rapper can come there and if they find something they like, mm -hmm. this is exactly how much it's going to cost, this is the rates, and they make them deliberately low enough that they're, they're not going to be beyond the scope of a new artist that's not mm -hmm. a big superstar at that point. I think it's a really cool concept. That's what I'm talking about. This is solution based. I like what Trap Tracklib is doing. Um, a friend of mine, Corey Moe, is an artist. I, I work with Corey Moe yeah. on stuff I did with CeeLo Green last year. Yeah. And that's what I'm talking about. So that that stuff with CeeLo Green is on a Corey Moe album with Bun B, who's the artist mm -hmm. who we just sampled. So um, Corey Moe is a great producer. Uh, I put out, put out his records with my label, Javoti Music. Um, and so he, me and him, when he first started dealing with the Tracklib thing, me and him went down a Bob James rabbit hole. You know, because I've been a fan for a long time. I just played yeah. record after record. Does and, he do the thing on when he works with you, uh, when he makes it rough, always put his name on it? Corey Moe. Corey Moe. <laughs> <laughs> That's the beginning of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. everything I did with That's him. called a beat tag. <laughs> it's, it's a sell because, job for because his Because in the hip-hop space, the producers, in this streaming era, the producers are not respected. So when you put out vinyl, you know, back in the days, like I said, I, said, I used to love the album covers, like the one-on-one -on -one album cover. It's a brilliant idea. I remember that I used to just be in my father's house and mm. I could open it up and see this is who's playing on it and this is who produced it. And, this is, and nowadays, if you're just streaming, what, what are you looking at? No one cares about the producers. No one cares yeah. about who made yeah. the music. So a producer like Corey Moe, who's big in the hip-hop space, if he doesn't put that beat tag on the beat, <laughs> it might yeah. come out on the radio and no one will know that he made this song. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a shout out to Corey Moe. A little moment at the to talk about Here We Go Again, because uh -huh. you brought it up, because it was probably the first time that I heard my music being sampled. That was a big, also, huge record. They won the Grammy for that. Won the Grammy yeah. for it. But what I remember thinking, because I didn't know anything about the, the hip-hop as that specific kind of an art form, mm -hmm. but I heard the record, and it was just my record played, and then they rapped over the top of it. It wasn't right. like a sample. It's just my album's playing. Right. And I immediately, one of the first things I thought of, hey, I'll go out and get a Frank Sinatra record, and I'll just noodle some piano <laughs> over, the, over the top of it. You should have did that. That would have been an ill mixtape back you know, in the day. Why not? <laughs> it's called a mashup. Yeah, why not? You know, And then I'll have yeah. a, give it another name. You know, he, he, <laughs> They changed Westchester Lady to Here We Go Again. Right. Here's a new title. And uh, all of a sudden, it's bye-bye to Bob, right. uh, but but I don't think I would have gotten away with it with Frank Sinatra. You would have, he, that would have, it would have, it would have aged well. You wouldn't have gotten away with it at the time. But uh, to hear you playing like over some Frank Sinatra, <laughs> that's very hip hop. That's very dope. And that would have been talked about as revolutionary. Yeah. And I think that's what's funny as I'm listening to you. The difference in how we grew up and our sensibilities, because by all means, you should feel how you feel. The the where you came out of what what y'all had to go through. We're standing on your shoulders. What y'all had to mm -hmm. go through to, through to create these little bits of music that we said, oh, we like this loop. Forget everything else you did. We like this part, and we're gonna loop this part over and over again. What y'all had to go through to create that one loop for us, you should feel a way about that, you know. But for me, because I grew up admiring hip hop in this hip hop generation, my sensibility is different. Whereas a friend of mine was asking me, what if they took your hook and sampled it? And what if they took your words and just your words just became it? And I'm like, that would be amazing. I love that. And, they, and somebody said, would you ask for any money for that? I'm like, probably not. I wouldn't, it wouldn't even cross my mind to do that because in my mind, well, that's what hip hop is. 
how can I say I'm a hip hop artist and get mad if somebody does that to me? You know, so it's mm-hmm. it's just interesting to me mm-hmm. that that I'm I'm listening to you, I'm 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 relating to your story, and also because I have musicians, um, these guys, Whiskey Boys, and and you play very well with them, and and I appreciate you coming. I love you guys. Yeah, I felt so at home. Yeah, shout Can't out. Can't wait to, for tonight. It's yeah. gonna be great. We got Rakim tonight with Kamayu and Chris Robb and Brady Watt. I, I did a show with them at Brooklyn Bowl in Philly, and we're killing it. We're having a good time, and the band is on fire. And this one girl in the front was in the front, just like yelling out like. Play get by, do get by, and I kind of was dim- dismissive to her. Funny, you know, like get by is like my free bird. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so she started to, the band was just doing solos, and she's frowning and making moaning and groaning sounds in the audience <laughs> as they're doing solos. And I just I I went off on her and <laughs> told her that she had to leave. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't be here. Like how are you gonna disrespect the? How are you gonna say that you have love for me but disrespect? These, this hard working band, yeah. it's this hard working. Yeah. This ain't just regular like, yeah. this took a lot for them to, to get to the point to be proficient enough, not even proficient, but great enough to be able to play with me. And I, I really appreciate, so I understand how you feel. Yeah, I wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I got a couple more questions. Thank you for your time. I definitely want to ask about working with Earl Klug and um, Kari, I love that so much. You, you, know, mm. Uh, mm. you know, these guys are winning Grammys. You're not, you won a Grammy for this, right? We did. Um, man, tell me about working with that guy. Earl, um, that record was probably the easiest, smoothest, most um, clear where we were headed. Um, sometimes when we create new stuff, it, the creative process is uh, birth pains, insecurity. You don't really know whether the direction you're taking is right or not or something mm-hmm. like that. But I had heard so much of Earl's playing mm-hmm. and when I actually got in the studio to collaborate with him, he he was such a romantic mm-hmm. and everything he played just seemed right. <laughs> that's you know? what, that's what it sounds, we sounds like. We hit record and yeah. I think probably very often take one was it. Mm. it you, you couldn't try to dress it up and make it better because the, the playing was very pure. I... Will brag out a little bit about myself. I think I'm a good accompanist. I think I can uh, make than... other artists sound good. I like using the piano as a support instrument, mm-hmm. and my chords or, or my choice of them. If I can make the lead melody person sound better, Earl had these amazing, great, simple but beautiful melodies, and they sound like almost like beginner melodies. They're mm-hmm. so simple. And of, oftentimes people will say that, and I say to them, you try it. <laughs> you try to come up with that sure. simple melody that only has five notes in it, but it, you immediately remember it, and it sticks in your brain. And Earl just had that and, and his, his power. Uh, and I loved working alongside him, being that more the arranger guy that supports it and made those melodies stand out more. You know who's like that in hip-hop? Drake, mm. like yes. take the take a strong five melodies and got you just like so, in the club in your so feelings. Very true. <laughs> very true. Um, a song that gets me in my feelings, and I don't know what it is about. I think it's because I raised on television. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm and there was a certain era of like I'm born in '75, so those records and those, you're taking in all this knowledge as a baby in your first five years more than any no- amount of knowledge you're gonna take for your whole life, and I'm taking in all this. All this music, you know, we talked about Ironside and the scoring of certain records, I mean, certain TV shows and movies in the 70s, which is mm-hmm. so much better. Something was going on. And that Angela um, is such a beautiful piece of music. I'm introduced to it because it's the theme to Taxi. Mm. So can you tell me about making that record and how it ended up becoming a theme for Taxi? Just a quick moment of what year were you born? 75. See, Nautilus, I was in there out at Rudy Van Gelder's uh, studio making Nautilus, and you weren't even a gleam in your mother's eye yet. That's right. My father, <laughs> my father was. You weren't even right. My father was Earth. in Westchester <laughs> contemplating moving to Brooklyn. You got created after <laughs> Nautilus came in, right. came into being. So that's just a little that's small right. moment uh, about Angela, another fluke. 
I was not trying to go after doing TV music. Uh, I was very happy doing my jazz stuff with CTI during that time. Mm -hmm. And the, the, those four records that I did with CTI were like a full-time thing for mm -hmm. me. And I got a phone call one day from a producer of this new upcoming TV series, Taxi, mm -hmm. and they had a copy of my album, Four the mm -hmm. CTI record and they liked the vibe of it they liked the sound and they literally said could you make us some similar music to that and um, because we feel that that captures the style and mood they were mm -hmm. looking for and I said I yes I can but I've done enough TV music or I've listened to enough that in a 30 minute sitcom the music cues are only going to be about 10 seconds long mm -hmm. for the most part. Right. And my my music usually lasts for six or seven minutes. Right. And, and my guys don't even get warmed up in the first right. 30 seconds. You know, right. it, it, by the time we make our intro, it's over. Mm -hmm. uh, so I asked them if they would let me just treat all of the recording of that TV music as if it was an album that I was working on. And I could use my people and I could make my cuts long. And I gave them permission to treat that music more like a library where their editor could chop me up and just right. use the 15 seconds of it that fit the of music edit. that more mm -hmm. rather than us having to have a cue come on where in the studio, okay, you know, the stopwatch is going and mm -hmm. the music can only happen for 15 seconds. It wouldn't have that same feeling. So... Uh, I, I did, did a recording session. I did not look at any. I did, hadn't even seen that going across the bridge, the opening segment in Taxi that is so mm -hmm. iconic, mm -hmm. uh, and the mood at dusk and all of that. Didn't even see it. So I did about seven or eight tunes. I, I tried to do happy, sad, fast, slow. I mm -hmm. give them a wide variety of music. And one of, the, one of those eight that wasn't really identified was Angela, or mm -hmm. it ended up being called Angela. And it was just, I thought maybe it might be a little piece of background music or something. And I had also submitted another piece that seemed to me more what they might like as a main theme. And I'm thinking um, loud, mu fast-paced New, New York music, taxi yeah. drivers, a lot of high, high energy. I wanted to give them something... Uh, fast and hot New York pace, something mm -hmm. like that. So uh, they listened to it, and they were already seeing, I think, that that bridge, taxi going over the bridge at dusk that was much more mellow. Mm -hmm. And they listened to my little background piece, and they said, um, would you uh, be willing to let us use this mm -hmm. as the main theme? And who was I to argue with that? Right. Uh, and... Uh, it became the main theme. Mm -hmm. I took the other piece and used it on my album, called it Touchdown, not right. having anything to do with it. So I, I made some use of my fast piece anyway. And the title Angela came about because the, the first time that the theme was used was on the first episode of the show that had to do with this main right. character, Angela. Right. Man, that's such an iconic piece of music. We've been performing that. Uh, at the shows, and we and CeeLo Green sampled it on a song called Sign of the Times, uh, which is a great song. If we've had my man Chris Robb singing it, so we go from Angela to the CeeLo Green has been a good time. And and you have a song, Sign of the Times, which is a great song as well. And Prince has a song called Sign of the Times. Mm -hmm. I need to just make a song called Sign of the Times, is, I think, the point of this story. I'll sample you, and then we're going to go all there the way around. There we go. Full yeah. circle. <laughs> Full circle. Now, some of the most popular records in your career, in terms of what people play in the streaming era to this day still are records you did with David Sanborn. And you are, I think, credited with ushering in a new type of sound in jazz, like a more electronic sound. and something that people sometimes call smooth jazz. Would you agree with that? I uh, agree with it. I don't always love being put in the box mm -hmm. or having what being artist typecast. Does. Yeah, what artist but, does. Uh, when, when people love what we do, you, mm -hmm. you got to like that. That makes us happy. Um, the double vision record with Dave Sanborn mm -hmm. that ended up with Maputo, which was probably the cut that was mm -hmm. played the most. Mm -hmm. I credit 
Marcus Miller, who composed it. Oh, man. He, he had the vision. He and David were already pretty close at that time, touring together. Mm -hmm. And Marcus was looking for something to present to, to David for this mm -hmm. project. And I heard Marcus's demo. I was like, ooh, yeah, we, mm -hmm. we got to do that. It's just great, great, great piece full of... Uh, passion and uh, just a great piece being of music. at the right place at the right time. Yeah. I appreciate in this newer era you did this Black Lives Matter video. Um, and I appreciate you showing up in that space. We uh, had Jon Stewart on and we talked to him about the fact that he did an episode about racism in which he only had white people on the panel with him because he remembered uh, Toni Morrison being interviewed by Charlie Rose and saying as a black woman, why... I, I need my white allies to show up in that space and, and work on the problem of race, racism. Like, why is it always on us to solve the problem? Mm -hmm. And so when an artist of your caliber makes a choice to show solidarity in that way and put, put it out in public, your, how you feel, which it should seem like a very simple thing, right? Let's be humane yeah. and kind. Um, but it is, a, it is a great choice, and I appreciate it. Thank you. I... I um don't usually get nervous when I play the piano, mm -hmm. but speaking words about this topic, which is very sensitive topic, mm -hmm. was very rough for me. And I still remember, I felt like I was almost in a trance when I got up enough nerve to do it mm -hmm. and, and actually figured out a little way of saying it that felt natural to me. Um, all of my friends in the theater that had guided me to be natural, be myself, uh, mm -hmm. all of that. But it, it, when I made my little statement, it wasn't in a studio like this with professionals. Mm -hmm. I had my iPhone. Right. I was by myself. Right. I only had myself to say that Black Lives Matter to me personally because my whole life went into jazz and I could run right down the line. Yeah, it matters. That's my life. And the fact that I could collaborate, that I was accepted into a primarily black art form where mm -hmm. all of the real major contributors, or at least the way, way big percentage of them, were black artists. Mm -hmm. And I was trying, knocking on the door trying to get in. Uh, in, in a way that I have shared with a lot of other white jazz musicians, we know that feeling when mm -hmm. you're not, you know, you're, you're not funky enough. You, right. You're not with me. You, you, you're trying, but uh, it's a nervous-making feeling as right. to whether you're going to be accepted. And I had lived it. Mm -hmm. That's my version of going into this world. And when I did get accepted... It's a very powerful feeling formed in my life, and that's kind of what I wanted to say, to thank all of my black friends, musicians, that made it possible for me to have this life. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Bob James. Thank you, Bob James. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the People's Party is proud to have Bob James in the house. Yes. Yes. Make some noise. Yes. And I'm very proud to be sitting here with you, Tareeb, and the fact that you invited me last year gave me such new great insight into your art form. Thank you. And I look forward to tonight. We're going to have a great time. Yes, indeed.